As I mentioned to you, I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. And, you know, 20 years, when you sign the note, it's like, goodness, what am I obligating myself to? And those of you that were here when we did that, you know it was a big step of faith for us, 1.3 million that we were committing ourselves to. But, you know, God is so faithful. And we paid it off in 11 years, 8 months. That's God, folks. That's God. And I am so honored to have with us today as our guest speaker, our district superintendent, Reverend Ken Bertram. I know him as Ken. I don't say that disrespectfully, but he was Ken before he was our district superintendent. And I've known him for a long time. His lovely wife, Janice, we're glad to have her with us today as well. And we've invited them to come and to share in this celebration time with us as a church family. I know you're going to be blessed. I know that you're going to be uplifted. And I'm going to ask a favor of you as your pastor. If you have cell phones, unless you're on call, don't just silence it. Turn it off unless you need it to look up scripture. Okay? We'll, we'll let you. If you're looking up scripture, that's between you and God. We'll allow you to leave it on. Okay? But otherwise, turn it off because I know the devil. I know the devil. He is ornery. He's a schemer. Right as Ken is, is going to be bringing home a very valuable point or whatever, your cell phone's going to vibrate, your cell phone's going to go off. So let's just nip it in the bud right now, turn them off unless you're on call, and uh, let's give him our undivided attention. I believe that he has a message from the Lord today. I believe it's a message that's going to encourage us as a church. And how many of you know that even though we've accomplished great things, the best is yet ahead? Did you hear what I said? Even though we've accomplished great things, the best is yet ahead. Amen? So would you just give a warm Harrisonburg welcome to our district superintendent, my friend, Reverend Ken Bertram. God bless you, Ken, as you come and share. Well, good morning, folks. It's kind of fun to have church service at tables, isn't it? It's kind of neat. Um, I'm so pleased to be here today in this celebration service with you. I've asked your pastor to stay here for a moment. Um, this is Pastor's Appreciation Sunday here, and I'm first of all thrilled when a church takes an opportunity like this to say thank you uh, to your spiritual leaders. Um, in my view, and I've been a, I'm a church person. I want you to know that I love the church and I've been involved in the church for many years now. And in my view, and I think it's a clear biblical view, the most important asset that a church has is a caring, competent, called pastor. It's really, you, yeah, amen. Amen. You could, the building that you have the building could be gone tomorrow. Now, you'd be disappointed having paid the last 11.8, I mean, you know, $1.3 million on it for it to be gone tomorrow, but it could be gone. But the church would still be here, and the pastor would still be here, and the Spirit of God would still be here, and you could still have church, and you could move forward to accomplish your destiny. Uh, the most important asset that this church has is not this building uh, or any other kind of physical asset, but it's a, it's a godly pastor. And you have a pastor that is known, and I'm try, not trying to embarrass him, but he's known amongst his colleagues as a man of God, a man of integrity, a spiritual leader, a great pastor. He is a leader in our district as a uh, district elder uh, on our board of presbyters. He represents you and this area extremely well. He's been a good friend for a long time. But what I wanted to do this morning is uh, a part of my role as the district superintendent by virtue of office, I am on the uh, Valley Forge. It's the University of Valley Forge. They've just changed their name, and this is the first time I'm trying to say it right because it's been Valley Forge Christian College for a long time. But the University of Valley Forge, um, and uh, I'm on their board of trustees, on the executive committee of the board of trustees for the University of Valley Forge. And I have a great honor today, uh, Pastor Jeff, and in front of this uh, congregation to present to you 
a plaque that you were given on Friday, but we wanted to, I wanted to do it here today f so that you all could know that your pastor, the University of Valley Forge and the Alumni Association present the 2014 Distinguished Alumni Ser Service Award to Jeffrey B. Ferguson, class of 1977. And this has been given to your pastor by the, uh, the uh, elders and the uh, board of trustees of the uh, University of Valley Forge. We want to present this plaque to him now. Would you give him your appreciation and applause? Amen. Come on, that's good. Come on, standing ovation, my friend. Amen. <laughs> no, don't listen to him. Give him a standing ovation. Yeah. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jeff. You know, leaders are, um, are very, very valuable. And uh, Jeff comes by his leadership skills coming from good stock. His father is here today, William Ferguson, Bill Ferguson, who was a leader in this district for many, many years. Bill, I know you're out there. I know that you don't want to look at me, but there you are. I see you. I'm so glad that you're here today sharing this, uh, this special time with your son and with this church. I know we got lunch coming in, and I'm going to kind of watch the back doors to watch them rolling in, but I wanted to uh, talk to you for a few moments this morning. And uh, I'm going to build the message around uh, the story of Nehemiah. So uh, I know it might take a little bit of time for you to find it. If you have your Bibles with you, why don't you try to find it? Now, he told you not to use your cell phones because he don't want you to text during the service, you know, and send emails and stuff like that back and forth. But if your Bible is on your cell phone, I give you privilege to look at your Bible on the cell phone. Maybe it's maybe that's not, but anyway, no playing games or anything like that. No texting, and uh, um, but uh, you're you're welcome to look at it, and if it's in, um, if you're looking at the scripture, and we're going to read a passage here from Nehemiah chapter seven in just a moment, or actually chapter six, I believe it's actually chapter six, Nehemiah chapter six. I want to, I, it's been mentioned today, it's been sung about today, and I want to draw your attention to um, something that uh, we all, whether we, whether we recognize it or not on a daily basis, we all lean on the fact that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he doesn't change, that he is faithful that he is faithful, and this idea of the faithfulness of God is, is, a, is a prominent biblical theme. Uh, you can really see it from, from uh, one side of Scripture to the other. I'm going to read a few verses on the faithfulness of God in just a moment, but I can tell you practically and personally, you are glad that this morning you woke up to the same God that you faced yesterday. This is a God that didn't get up on the wrong side of bed this morning like your wife did. I, maybe I should say like your husband did because that's more. You didn't get up, you didn't, uh, get up this morning and face a God that is angry because he just didn't get the right, uh, right uh, dinner served to him last night. Come on, are you with me on this? You've, we have a God who is the same. It, biblically, theologically, it's called his faithfulness. It's core to his being. He is the same. He never changes. When, when we were kids and growing up in the church and sang, singing from the hymnal, you know, and that's the church that I grew up in, sang from the hymnal, just like many of you did, we sang a song that you could sing today, and you all would know it. I'm not going to try to lead it, but it's a song. Uh, I don't know if the choir is going to sing it or not, but it's a song that I thought of when I was thinking about what, what today means in the life of this church. And it's a song that says this, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There's no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. What's the next line say? Thy compassions, they fail not. Aren't you thankful for that? 
Come on now, aren't you thankful for that, that our God is compassionate towards us? That's how he looks at us. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. The chorus says, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. What a great song. Let me just read those, the other two verses. Just, to, just listen now. Summer and winter, springtime, harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. In other words, these things don't change. They, they're, they're, they uh, come and they flow in our lives and we depend upon them. And pardon for sin. And a peace that endure, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and what? Bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning. What's it say? New mercies I see. When you rolled out of bed this morning, our God uh, was not frowning at you. He was full of new mercies in your life. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. The hymn is uh, based in, in part, it's really on several scriptures, but one of the scriptures it's based on is a scripture from the book of Lamentations. And a lot of you know this scripture. Let me just read this to you. I, I want to establish what I'm trying to do here is establish the fact that the God that we serve is faithful. Because what you are doing here today is you're embedding in the history of this church a marker. Right? Come on. It's a marker. And you're saying, look, our God has faithfully provided to this day. And we, we celebrate that. We rejoice in that. And we also look at it in hope, Pastor Jeff, that our God is going to continue to provide wisdom and resources and help and energy and strength and people and vision to move forward to the destiny that the Lord God has inscribed in heaven for Harrisonburg First Assembly. Amen. I love it. I love your logo, HVA. It's a, and God has a plan for you. You know, you, and I believe that. God was around when this church got planted and, uh, and you have not achieved your full destiny yet. And I swear, so in Lamentations, it says this, and this is, a, this is from Jeremiah, the prophet, and I won't go into the context. Just listen, as, as the, the writer of Lamentations, Jeremiah says, I remember my afflictions and my wandering and the bitterness and the gall. You know, he was involved. He was the prophet that prophesied the exile of the people. Uh, into, uh, into uh, Nebuchadnezzar's hands. And he says, I will remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The rock of this hope is what? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. And um, I, as I was thinking about this service today and over this, this last week and, and the week before and thinking about what this meant to you as a church, the Lord really inscribed in my spirit that today as a demonstration to anybody that would observe that God is faithful that he cares about you, that his mercies are renewed every day, and that he has declared himself as on your side. Come on, our God is not against you. He's on your side. Now look, he, 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 when we sin against him, our God is brokenhearted. He doesn't want us to live in sin. He doesn't want us to feed on the husks of this earth. But still, he loves us. He still loves us. His grace is, is flowing from heavenly places towards us. His mercy is renewed every day. And I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Our God is faithful. James, the, uh, the uh, brother of Jesus, describes the heavenly father this way. 
And he says, as one who does not change like shifting sa shadows. Aren't you thankful for that? Come on, you, he's not one that is, that is, uh, that is uh, darting around in the shadows and, and that you have to appease today and, and he's going to turn his back on you tomorrow and all those kinds of things. Not, that's not the God that we serve. He has declared himself to be faithful. He is faithful and you can wait on him because he's good for his word. Amen. Come on now. Our God is who he says he is. And he does what he says he will do. He is faithful. His faithfulness is a core tenet of the understanding of his nature. It's central theme in scripture. Numbers 23, God is not a human that he should lie. Come on. He's not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Come on, you know who said those words? Balaam. <laughs> Balaam said that. He knew something about God. And the people said, come on, prophesy a curse on this Israel. And he says, I can't do that. You think the God of heaven is like a man that he should lie or change his mind? He doesn't, does he not speak and then act? Does he not promise and not fulfill? Come on, think about it. The God that you serve, the God that you said yes to when you accepted Jesus Christ, the God of heaven is not a God that would lie to you, and he's not a God that would promise and not fulfill it. And some of you have heard a word of promise, and you get tired of waiting. But he will fulfill if you wait on him. Uh, Exodus 34, this is a great passage. I'm just going to read, read a couple verses here. The Lord came down and, you know, because Moses, what Moses do? Moses said, I, I want to see you. And God says, all right, I'm going to tuck you away here. I'm going to reveal myself to you, and I'm going to pronounce my name to you. In other words, I'm going to tell you who I am. And so then the Lord came down in a cloud, and he stood there with him, and he proclaimed his name. The Lord, that's in the uh, Hebrew language, what they call a tetragrammaton. It's four Hebrew letters, and you could, you, it used, it used to uh, translate it Jehovah. Uh, nobody knows how to translate it because it became so holy in the Hebrew language, they, uh, they never translated it. They never pronounced the name because they didn't want to take the name in vain. Uh, in today's language, they would say Yahweh. And so he says, he proclaimed his name, Yahweh. And then he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh. Listen, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. So God has said to us, as he, you know, as Moses says, the representative of mankind, as God was telling him who he is, it, Moses, this is who I am. Listen to what he says. He says he passed in front of him, he says he's compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. It's right at the core of his being. Deuteronomy 7, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors. See, and this is again, Moses is saying, why do, you, why do you think God chose you? You think it's because you're somebody special? I, he didn't, that's my interpretation of what Moses said. And I mean, that may not have been exactly what he said, but he said, but no, it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand and he redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. You see the theme that I'm trying to drill into our hearts and minds here today? Our God is of course full of compassion, he's full of love, but he is at the very center of his being what? Faithful. He is faithful. Joshua 23. Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that no one of all the good. Listen, he says, Joshua says, I'm about to leave you. He's going to die is what he's saying. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises of the Lord your God. Let me say it again. Not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. 
Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. And if you in honesty could day, today could stand before the Lord your God, could you accuse him of, of having deceived you or lied to you or failed in his promises? Every promise of God is declared to be yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Come on. The, in Psalm 145, the Lord is trustworthy in all his promises, and he is faithful in all that he does. Come on. He is faithful. My God himself, Paul says, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Come on now. If you've been called to faith in Christ Jesus, Again, come on, I, if you are living in sin and if you're abiding sin in your spirit, come on, it breaks the heart of God. Stop it. Lay it aside. Stop feeding on the husks of this, the empty husks of this world. They're not going to satisfy your soul. But the God who has called you to faith in Jesus Christ is going to keep you until that day, until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because of your great strength? No, because the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. He will do it. His keeping power is on you. Second Timothy 2 is the last scripture I'm going to read about this, the faithfulness. If we are, and this is a great passage, and this is always a little bit challenging to me, but 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he can't disown himself. So he's saying it's right at the core of his being. He said, Moses, you want to know my name? My name is faithful. I'm the faithful one. It's right at the core of who he is. And if even if we are faithless, which we are from time to time, you know that. He's not. He can't be faithless. He cannot disown himself. So the scripture makes it very clear, cover to cover. And that's, you know, five or six of about 100 verses that you could look at that just focuses on this part of the God. So you and I, we, we may not be so faithful. Uh, it's a quality to be valued and pursued, but sometimes we fall short. Romans 3 says, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human, every human being a liar. He is faithful to his word. Okay. Amen. I believe the Bible clearly declares that. And I think it makes it clear that our God will remain faithful to his promise to help his children and his children who persevere in obedience to his word. And so this is what I'd like to and Pastor Jeff and elders of this church and folks here who love this church. And, um, and uh, here's what I, I have heard the Lord saying inside of me. That great success, the formula for great success. Come on, stay with me just for a moment. Lean in here. The formula for great success and victory in Christ Jesus has two components to it. One is a constant. The other is a variable. The constant is the faithfulness of God to his word. The variable is the perseverant obedience of his servants. That's the variable. Now, you're coming today to a great moment of celebration. We are debt free. Wouldn't you like to see Jeff dance? Wouldn't you like to see him dance up here? I think that would be great, and I really think he should do it. And you've got a group here that would love to see you come up here and dance. But I'm not going to. Now, I have danced in church. I want you to know that. I did. I danced in church. It was an African church. And my rule is this. If the pastor don't dance, I don't dance. But on that day, the pastor danced, and somebody grabbed me and pulled me into the dance line. And it was, it was really kind of scary, actually. And, and some guy actually videoed it. And I said, if you ever, if I ever see that on the interweb, you're well, I'm not going to say what I said to him. But anyway, I didn't know it was awful. Anyway, how did I get on that? You got, yeah, 
you got the faithfulness of God that is the absolute constant in the equation. The variable is the obedience of men. Now, you know that you didn't get to this day unless there were some servants of the Lord God Almighty who said, we have heard God's word and we're going to persevere in obedience until we get to this place. Do you know that? You got a pastor, you got a pastoral staff, you got a board of elders in this church. They have said a long time ago, hey, we are doing what we, what we have been called to do by the hand of God and build this building. We're going to borrow some money to do it because we feel like it's the right thing to do. But we're going to pursue this debt until it's gone. And today, because of their persevering obedience, you say it's gone. Our God is faithful. Amen. Come on. Our God is faithful. And his servants have been obedient, and they have persevered in their obedience until this day. And so those equations are so important. Now, I'm not going to, uh, the book of Nehemiah is a wonderful book. I want to challenge you to read it at some point, especially those of you. And I have felt, you know, I have just felt strangely moved as I've prepared over the last few days, especially to come here, that there may be one or two or three or maybe a dozen or maybe a few more to whom God has been speaking about a task, a project, a vision, a, a, a work that's beyond you. It's something bigger than you. And you, you don't know how you're going to do it, but you feel the stirring in spirit and the passion growing up in your heart. And the book of Nehemiah is a story of a young man who was told that the city of Jerusalem was in rubble. And he says it was the city where his fathers are buried. It was in ruin and, his, uh, and the walls were broken down. The walls of, a, of the defense around the city were broken down. And it began to stir in him. Come on, Pastor Jeff, you know what this feels like. I know what it feels like. A vision that is beyond you that is bigger than you, that is something you can't do on your own, but there is a passion that won't quit in your heart. Anybody resonate with that? Now, come on. And, and, and it's just stirring in there and stirring in there and stirring in there. And when he heard the report from, from his brother who had come from Jerusalem that the city lie in ruins, even though they had, Ezra had taken a group back and they had rebuilt the temple and they were rebuilding some homes and stuff, but the walls were broken down and they were vulnerable to the assault of their enemy. And, and when Nehemiah I heard this uh, he was troubled in spirit and it said he began to fast and he began to pray and he began to confess and cry out to the Lord as the Lord began to work that vision deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into his soul and then he can't the courage and it's if that's where you're sitting today then you need to read the book of Nehemiah and look at how he approached it because he cried out to God and said God give me courage he was the cupbearer to the king King Artaxerxes first. He was a Persian king. He had absolute authority. If he wanted you dead, you were dead. He had absolute authority. And, and uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king, and he knew he could step in, but he, he feared the king, but he said, God, give me courage. He stepped into the presence of the king. The king then brought up, why are you so sad? And you know, if you've read it, you know the story. And he said, it's because my city lies in ruin. He said, okay, uh, uh, what is it that you want? And, and Nehemiah began to lay out before him, I need resources and I need freedom to go to our city and I need authority to the trans-Euphrates governors and, and I need your help to make this happen. And the king responded in favor towards him. And Nehemiah knew at that point that his God, who is faithful, was working on his behalf to make these things happen. And he made the journey to the city of uh, Jerusalem. And he didn't tell anybody what he was going to do, but he got there and two or three days after he had rested, he began to walk around the walls. And he saw the walls of that great city in rubble. Nebuchadnezzar had broke those walls down, had, had burned the gates and broke the walls down and tore down the, uh, the defense line of that great city, Jerusalem, where God had placed his name. And Cyrus had already sent this group back with Ezra to rebuild the temple, but the walls were still in ruin. And Nehemiah walked and he saw, and he saw the pile of rubble, the rubble that was so great. He didn't know how to do it. But and then he called the elders of the people together. And he said, all right, God, let me tell you why I'm here. 
God has spoken to me. We need to rebuild these walls. And he began to speak vision into the life of that, uh, that group of elders and leaders. And they began to respond and say, yes, let's rise to the task and do it. And then they started doing it. And they started doing it because the God that they served, they knew he was faithful. And they knew he would help them. And so they began to rebuild the walls and the neighboring governors, the governors of the area up there uh, in, 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 in the area where um, Jerusalem is, they opposed them and they mocked them and they ridiculed them and they tried, to, uh, they tried to assault them openly. And when God revealed that, then they had tried to infiltrate their ranks with guerrilla warfare. And then the people became discouraged. If you read the first six chapters of the book of Nehemiah, you see this again and again and again, all the opposition, all the resistance, all the frustration, come on, all of the things that had caused their hearts to break inside of them. How can we get this done? How can we get this done? But Nehemiah, this man of God, continued to cry out to God for help, for strength, for the revelation of God in his own life, and he led that group of people. When you look at the, the story of the rebuilding of the walls, you see 47 different groups that started working on the stones and the gates of the wall. 47 different groups of people. He marshaled all of the people together and he worked with them. It's such an interesting um, uh, you know, a description of the people. There was some, one, one of the persons was a goldsmith. One of them was a perfume maker. And I thought, that's interesting that the perfume maker would be rebuilding the walls. And I don't know anything about perfume making, but he's out there rebuilding the walls. One, it says of one guy that he, he took a section of the walls and he is, apparently didn't have any sons. And so his daughters helped him to rebuild the walls. Come on, ladies. Couldn't you, you should. His daughters helped him rebuild the walls. Everybody got engaged. There's one section in there that says, it's an interesting one because it says of the elders of Tekoa. It says the noblemen of Tekoa refused to put their shoulders to the work. So these guys said, I'm too good for this. I'm not going to get involved in this work. I'm too good. I'm a noble. I, this is for servants. I, you think I'm going to get out there and get myself dirty and put these rocks up there? And I can tell you that forever, come on, <laughs> forever it's listed that the, uh, the noblemen of Tekoa didn't, didn't do their job. They were losers. They were wusses. Let's stop there. I don't know what else to call them, but when you get to heaven, hey, and, I, and I just thought about this the other day. I was talking to my son about it, actually, and, and I said, you know, when you get to heaven, you're walking down the, the, the road of heaven, and you meet somebody and say, well, who were you? And where did, I'm one of the noblemen of Tekoa. He probably wouldn't even say that. But the thing that would come to your mind is you're one of those wusses that wouldn't build a wall. Now, you wouldn't say that because you're too nice to say things like that, but it would be in your mind because, now listen. The history of this church is being written, and you don't want that written about you. Right, Pastor Jeff? You don't want that written about you. On the page that has your name in it, you don't want it said, this guy was just too wussy to help anything. He was too, he, he, he was out watching football. He wouldn't help. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Come on. You still with me? <laughs> I better move on, Jeff. I got to come to a conclusion here. Okay, listen. So they worked and worked and worked and worked and all of this opposition and all of the things, internal strife and everything. But they got down to the end of it. And here, this, let me read all of this opposition. And then you get to uh, Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15. Look what it says. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, at the surround, uh, heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid, and they lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of Yahweh. Amen. Come on. The enemies of the kingdom of God 
when they see you moving forward, when they see you doing things that you couldn't do on your own, when they see you rising up and saying, I know this is bigger than me. I'm not smart enough to make this happen. I'm not resourceful enough to make this happen. But I am faithful enough to listen. I mean, I am going to believe that the faithful God of heaven can help me and that when he works through me, he can stretch out my hand and make this happen. And when it happens to the glory of the living God, the enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ tremble because they know that God has done this. Pastor Jeff, God has done this. He has done this in this church. And he is not done. He, he is not done with you. He's still writing chapters in the history of Harrisonburg First Assembly. Let it be, Lord. And there are still walls to be rebuilt. There are still visions to be accomplished. There are still missions to be done. And the reason I know that is this, that Jesus Christ gave to his church this mission. And he said, I want you to be going into the world. And that's what you all are doing every day. And as you are going into the world, I want you to preach this gospel to every creature. And I want you to make disciples of every nation. And I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to teach them everything that I have taught you. That's what Jesus said to his church. And so until the last person in this community is brought to Christ, or until God says enough is enough and sends his son back, we still have a mission. We still have a wall to build. We still have an advancement to make to the kingdom of God. Come on, are you with me on this? This is a marker that's placed into the earth of this church, a precious marker that says our God is faithful, but he has more for you to do. And the formula goes like this, the faithfulness of God plus the persevering obedience of his servants equals great victory and great success. And amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap offering of praise. Pastor Jeff, I want to pray for you and your church here for just a moment, and then I'm going to turn it back over to you as we conclude. But I want to pray that our God would help you, would refresh you. Father, in Jesus' name, for this precious congregation of believers, Lord. Lord, I, I stumbled around here a little bit today and tried to declare what I hear in my own heart, that you are a faithful God that you will fulfill your promise. And folks, listen to me. Lean in just a moment. Has God whispered a word in your spirit? Has God troubled your heart? Has God filled you with passion and compassion like he did Nehemiah when he grieved over the state of his city? Is there something that you're grieving over? Is there something that you are moved towards? Something that God himself has placed in your spirit? fast and pray and seek his face and let it grow and mature within you. But then when the day comes, it's time to step up and take action and move forward in Jesus' name. And what you can depend on is this. If you obey the word of God in your spirit and if you persevere in the pursuit of that divine destiny, the faithful God of heaven will come along to your side until when you get to this whole thing and you look back on it, you will say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Father, I pray your blessing upon this church, this precious body of believers here. I pray your blessing upon Pastor Jeff and Bonnie, these friends who I know the spirit of God dwells in them. They're leading this church in righteousness and they're leading this church in boldness. And as we spoke even before, the work is not yet done, Lord God. Lord, this great, uh, um, this great college that's right here, this university that's right across the road here, Father, in Jesus' name. 
Shatalara compras tantele brinio norots paratukaya. Don't you believe that the Spirit of the Living God wants to send the fire of renewal on that campus? Don't you believe that the Spirit of God wants to send the fire of renewal in the high schools, in the youth, in the young adult community, amongst the seniors? Come on, don't you see it and sense it in spirit that the Lord God Almighty, the God of heaven and earth, has chosen from the north, south, east, and west to send them in? Why not here, Lord? Why not send them in right here so that they hear the proclaimed word just like we, we know that Pastor Jeff proclaims it. Lord, I'm asking you to send them in here and that these precious men and women, Lord, are building the walls, are building the walls of defense here and are, are building a city of the holy God. God, we lean on, the fa on your faithfulness to help us to do it, but we are com committing ourselves to faithful service to pursue what you have placed in our heart, the word of the living God. And I thank you for it. And I thank you, Father God. And I'm asking you now to pour out your spirit upon this place and to give fresh vision and fresh direction and let them know, Lord God, the pathway that you have laid out for them so that they can look back one day and say, look, look what God has done. Look what God has done. Today, Lord, we declare you're the faithful God who has provided for us, but we also declare that we will be obedient to the heavenly vision as we move forward in Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. Would you